Welcome to Razorback Reels. I'm Ani Olivas. And I'm Drew Chamberlain. Thank you for joining us. How else would we start our show than to cover all of the latest news? Oops, she did it again. Making headlines for her new memoir, Britney Spears is back in the spotlight. Her memoir, The Woman in Me, released today, and everyone is searching the book for all the details of the, star, of the starlet's troubled life. Topics, in, topics include her past relationships, conservatorship, and growing up in the spotlight. Ani, will you be reading? And I will be reading at some point. Unfortunately, I am still trying to catch up on Jeanette McCurdy's I'm Glad My Mom Has mm -hmm. Died. Yep. Um, but I'll get there eventually. But for now, I will just be getting updates from Twitter. I'm still Or X, sorry. No, of course. I'm still reading the, the classics right now, 1984, stuff like mm -hmm. that. And so I don't know if I'm going to get to Britney Spears' memoir anytime soon. But <laughs> I'm definitely sure there's some interesting stuff in there. I would love to hear about her like 2007 like shaved head phase. Like I'm sure that would be you a fantastic read 1984 breeze. in high school? No, I did not okay. read 1984 in high school. <laughs> <laughs> While Britney's memoir is an accurate reflection of her life, a wax sculpture in Paris failed to capture its star's resemblance. The Grey Vaux Museum unveiled its Dwayne the Rock Johnson figure last week, and the figure, no doubt, faced immediate criticism due to the light complexion of the half Samoan, half black actor's skin. Drew, do you see the resemblance, or is it giving more Mr. <laughs> Clean? I I gotta be honest, when I look <laughs> at this face, the, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is not the first thing that pops into my mm. head. Now, if you were to kind of squint your eyes a little bit, and maybe it was in a really dark room, then maybe you could be like, yeah, that's Dwayne The Rock Johnson, but I, I, I don't see how they thought that this was a accurate representation of The Rock. There's just something missing. Just I, I, don't, I don't know what's missing. I, it could be the fact, yeah. It, it might it, be melanin. The, um, the Mr. But. Clean. <laughs> kind of look he's got going on. He really does look very suave. I say they got the they got the facial structure right, yeah. but just the complexion of his skin maybe. Probably a little, maybe a lot off. Anyway, while The Rock was born in 1972, no one has made their birth year part of their brands as, success, as successfully as America's favorite blondie. That's right, our producer, Maddie, is making me talk about none other than Taylor Swift yet again, and I'm thrilled about it. Swift's fourth re-recorded project re-releases this Friday. 1989, Taylor's version includes five previously unreleased songs. Ani, do I even have to ask you if you'll be listening on Friday? I 100% will be listening all day for probably the rest of the year. I'm so excited about this. 1989 has actually moved into uh, my number one spot for my favorite of her albums. Mm. And it's just such a summer album and it's such, it's very nostalgic for me because it just represents a time in my life. And I'm so excited for her because obviously, we'll talk about this later, um, but her new relationship, it just, it's just a new era for her, and it's just so reminiscent of the actual 1989 era. It's just so perfect, and it makes me so happy. I'm just, uh. Ditto. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> for our next segment of the night, we have winners and losers. Our in-studio reporters will be breaking down who's on top and who's in their flop era each week. Razorback Reels reporter Connor Marsh is here with the weekly breakdown. Hey Reels fans, I'm Connor Marsh here to break down this week's winners and losers. All right, starting with the winners, both of these were pretty easy picks for me. It's gotta be Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. The two have been gaining attention for their relationship online since they started dating. Let's start with Taylor. She's got the release of 1989 Taylor's version on Friday. The Ares Tour film made 129 million at the box office and Cruel Summer just went number one on the billboard yesterday. Plus, this woman has taken over football. They cut to Taylor after every play, and the commentators are making puns to her song lyrics. Plus, the Chiefs even said yesterday that Travis averages more receiving yards a game when she's in attendance. Now, on to Mr. Kelsey himself. Not only did the Chiefs win yesterday over the Chargers, he had 179 receiving yards with one touchdown. His podcast, New Heights, with his older brother and center for the Eagles, Jason Kelsey, is the second most listened to podcast on Spotify behind Joan Rogan. Plus, Taylor's been getting this man some clean-looking outfits ever since they've started hanging out together. I mean, this man is, is dripping with style. That's what makes this celebrity couple my winners of the week. And now, on to the losers. Dan Enos was fired as offensive coordinator on Sunday following the loss to Mississippi State on Saturday. And before you ask, no, this is not the sports advantage. You're still watching Razorback Reels. Enos led the Arkansas offense to a whopping average of 2.9 yards a play on Saturday. 
coach Sam Pittman said that Dan worked extremely hard, but it just wasn't working. Hopefully Arkansas can bounce back, but I wouldn't get my hopes up. And my last loser of the week is the entire city of Houston, Texas, after the Astros lost to the Rangers last night, ending their shot at the World Series. Houston took an 11-4 loss last night to the Rangers in the ALCS Championship. The Rangers will advance to the World Series, playing the winner of the Diamondbacks and the Phillies. And the Astros are going back to Houston. That's all the time I have this week. Reporting for Razorback Reels, I'm Connor Marsh, sending it back to you anchors. Thanks, Connor, for that recap of the heroes and villains of the entertainment world this week. And you know I have to bring it back to Taylor Swift, as always. Um, like I said earlier, um, this new relationship, she is so much in the forefront of everyone's mind. She's back in the spotlight, and it's just so reminiscent of the 1989 era when she was the most followed person on Instagram. And then whenever she got into the relationship with he who shall not be named, um, you know, she kind of just disappeared for a little bit. And now we're back seeing her like being happy, being confident and being able to express herself. And I just love this for her because he's not afraid of letting her shine. And I think that's what makes this a good relationship. Anyways, sports. Speaking of losers, I mean, got to say Houston, I mean, you know, granted they had that cheating scandal a couple of years ago and now with their loss against uh, the Texans, I have to say that, you know, it's not a great week to be from Houston. While I'm not from Houston, I can sympathize with those who are from Houston. Um, and on top of the other sports news, uh, having Dan Enos fired as well for 2.9 yards averaging. <laughs> uh, so I think that was a, a good move on Arkansas's part. Yeah, well, coming up, we'll be talking about all talking all about one indie musician's rise to mainstream popularity. Stick around after the break. Welcome back to Razorback Reels. We hope you're still tuned in because our next segment, Hog Wild Harmonies, covers all things music. From artists to albums, in our, our in-studio reporters are here to break down the greatest hits. Many new artists have debuted in 2023, but some more established artists have been making new names for themselves from releasing music as a school project to becoming one of the genre-defining indie musicians. We have Gigi Kramer live in studio to recap the career of Mitski. I'm here to talk about Mitski. Mit songwriter Mitski Miyawaki has come a long way. Her first two albums, Lush and Retired from Sad New Career Business, were self-recorded, self-produced, and released entirely for her school. She's now an Oscar nominee and a Billboard Hot 100 charting artist. But just how did she get here? Mitski has been making and releasing music since 2012, when she self-released Lush. She followed it up with Retired from Sad, New Career in Business in 2013. But both of these albums were projects she had to complete to complete her college degree in composition. Her breakout record was Bury Me at Makeout Creek, which was released under Double Double Whammy, a record label owned and operated by alumni from her music school, which is Purchase College of Music. Over the next few years, Mitski released two more albums and gained exposure through playing festivals like South by Southwest and opening for Lord's Melodrama Tour and a handful of her songs going viral on TikTok. She was seemingly at the height of her career in 2019, but that was when she made a tweet announcing that her next show would be her last indefinitely. Shortly after, she deactivated all of her social media accounts and went dormant. Though she had assured fans that she wasn't quitting music, nearly two years of radio silence proved otherwise. Though she worked on a few projects in 2020, but none of them were related to her solo music career. She was burnt out from the public eye and many fans doubted that Mitski would ever return. But in the fall of 2021, her social media accounts were reopened. This time, they were fully managed by her PR team. A release date for an upcoming single for her sixth studio album was released, but there wasn't any other information shared, not even the album name. Eventually, after another single and a tour announcement, her album Laurel Hell was released was announced. It was released in February of 2022 and she began touring shortly after its release date. Mitski's popularity 
didn't diminish during her hiatus. If anything, she, it grew. She performed sold out shows at every stop of her international tour. But in March of 2023, her social medias were once again wiped clean. It took four months, but in an, unli in an unlisted YouTube video in July of this year, she announced the lead single for the seventh studio album, The Land is Inhospitable and So Are We. The album was released on September 15th, barely making the Grammy eligibility deadline for the 2024 awards. While the singles for the album were fairly successful, nobody expected the popularity of the album's seventh track, My Love, Mine, All Mine. The song has been streamed over 100 million times on Spotify in the five weeks since it has released, and it may very well mark Mitski's break into the mainstream. My Love, Mine, All Mine has been Mitski's first song to chart on the Billboard Hot 100. It debuted at number 76, quickly climbed to the top 50, and this week it is charting at number 35. Earlier this year, she was also nominated for her first Oscar. She collaborated with Sun Lux and David Byrne on the song This Is A Life for the film Everything Everywhere All At Once. She has been submitted for seven Grammy Awards, and with the breakout success of her newest album, some nominations may very well be in her future. Only time will tell, as nominations don't come out for another two weeks, but I know I will be keeping my fingers crossed. For Is Your Back Reels, I'm Gigi Kramer. Back to you, anchors. Thanks, Gigi, for recapping that indie darlings rise to stardom. I gotta say, it's really exciting to see indie artists like that break into the top uh, 100 on the billboard, so that's really exciting to see. Yeah. Happy to see more of that, Ani. Mm -hmm. um, Ditto. <laughs> After the break, we'll be debriefing all the drama. Stay tuned to learn all the latest. Welcome back to Razorback Reels. Nothing reflects the state of the world quite like reality TV. But let's be honest, there are so many shows to keep up with. How could we ever keep track of all the latest drama? That's where our next segment comes in, Reality Recap. Our reporters break down their favorite shows, and this week we have Jordan Lassiter to recap Love is Blind. I'm Jordan Lassiter. Welcome to this week's edition of Reality Recap, where I'm rehauling it to be my segment, What Really Matters, where I give you my opinion because my opinion really matters. After tuning in to season five of Netflix's Love is Blind, I have a lot of them. Season five has been filled with some pretty problematic people, so let's see if these guys are gonna be a groom or doomed. Let's start with Lydia and Milton. They have a six year age gap with Lydia being 30 and Milton being 24. I think Milton is too immature to deal with all the baggage Lydia comes with. Her ex Uche is also on the show, and he can account for all of the craziness she put him through, including sucking his friends on social media, stakeouts at his house late at night, and even joining the show just to follow him and try to get back together. So I vote doomed. Even if they do walk down the aisle, Milton will soon break from Lydia's spell. Next, we have Stacy and Izzy. Izzy is very accomplished in her career and is used to living on her own terms. Izzy is a boy man who wants a relationship, but isn't exactly in the right stage of his life to build a family. After getting engaged, Stacy finds out Izzy is in credit card debt and has a credit, uh, credit score. Looks like she can't find her right trade at Sephora or the right man in this experiment. On top of what he told her, he believes that in a, rela a relationship, a man and a woman should split the bills 50-50, which is something Stacy just didn't see coming. So I vote. Groom. Stacy is so blind and desperate for a ring, she's not going to consider their financial differences a problem until after they walk down the aisle. Next, we have Uche and Aaliyah. So after finding out that Uche's ex, Lydia, was also a contestant on the show, Aaliyah fled back home with no warning, just got on a flight. Even though she and Uche rekindled after leaving the pods, I don't think Aaliyah is secure enough in herself to be in a, a relationship with Uche. Uche is very straight, and dry and doesn't provide much emotional connection in their relationship. So I vote doomed. Aaliyah is as sensitive as they come and I think fundamentally they just don't work. So tweet me and let me know who you think is gonna be a groom 
or doomed. Would you be interested in being on the next season of Love is Blind? Me personally, I could never be on the show. I need to make sure the guy is over 6'2". I'm Jordan Lasseter. Thank you for joining me for What Really Matters. What a super season of Love is Blind. Thanks, Jordan, for recapping it for us. Drew, do you really think that these like reality love competitions end up in anything actually real? Uh, no, no, I absolutely do not. And if you just watch some of the shows and you see some of the editing and stuff like that, it's all very staged, all very mm -hmm. fake, except for um, The Golden Bachelor, which I <laughs> believe is the most authentic reality dating show today. But I still can't get over the makeup that we saw <laughs> just a second ago. That was crazy. What are your, what are your yeah. thoughts? No, I agree. I think that most of the time, they, especially now with social media, I think people are just on it to, even if they're on it for like two seconds, they get a million followers on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter for them. So I think people are just on it to get followers. You know? I totally get it. Yeah. While we are here at Razorback Reels trying to be fair journalists, sometimes the tea is just too hot to ignore. Our next segment, D1 Drama covers all the crazy headlines. We have Elena Thompson in studio to give us all the juicy details of this week's drama. Thanks guys. The first juicy drama I'm covering this week features none other than Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith. Now, we all remember the slap that rocked the world last spring. Just, but just as a recap, Chris Rock made a joke at Jada Pinkett Smith's expense at the 2022 Academy Awards, Awards calling her G.I. Jane. After Chris Rock's remarks, Will Smith told him to quote, keep his wife's name out of his mouth. He then went onto the stage and to everyone's dismay, slapped Chris Rock clean across the face. Flash forward to now where the real tea is brewing. Jada Smith has come out and said that her and Will have been separated for the last six years since 2017. Jada described her and Will as living completely different lives, and while they aren't legally divorced, they might as well be. Fans were shocked by this news, especially considering the slap. Pinkett has come out and said that she thought the slap was a part of a skit and didn't realize it was real until after it happened. Truth be told, fans are baffled by the news and shocked that he that she condemned the excuse me, shocked that she condemned the slap even though he was defending her to begin with. But moving on, I have some continuing coverage on Ariana Grande. Last time I was on Razorback Reels, I talked about how Dalton Gomez and Ariana Grande had finalized their divorce with Gomez receiving a hefty settlement from Ariana. But this past weekend, Ariana Grande has been seen in New York City having drinks with none other than her co-star Ethan Slater. Slater plays the opposite role of Ariana Grande in their upcoming on-screen rendition of Wicked, and Dalton Gomez doesn't seem to be bothered too, too much doesn't seem to be too bothered by the drama. He has been spotted himself smooching on actress Maka Monroe. While Slater and Grande got a bit of a messy start, it seems like they aren't splitting anytime soon. Well, that's all the time I have for D1 Drama. Reporting for Razorback Reels, I'm Elena Thompson. Thanks, Elena, for updating us on all the celebrity buzz. Now, I, I have very strong feelings about the Will Smith, <laughs> uh, Jada Pinkett Smith um, debacle, I would say. I don't, I don't know. I feel like uh, not saying Jada is in the wrong, but obviously from the public's perspective, it seems like it's she's bringing details to light that may only help her in certain situations and putting poor Will Smith down, even kind of the comments she made about her and Tupac Shakur being her one and only love. Oh, Not gosh. sure how Mr. Smith feels about that, but that's just me. How about Ariana Grande? Um, I honestly, I'm just so confused at this point. I don't know what, I, I, to be honest, I can't get over, um, I don't remember his name. Um, his son is, no, the Ethan Slater. Ethan yes, Slater. Ethan Slater. Um, he just has super sunken in eyes, and I can't. He looks like a serial killer, and I don't like. I saw it with Pete Davidson a little bit, but I don't know. Ethan Slater, I just can't get behind, especially how it all started. I don't know. That's just me, though. But our final coverage of the night brings the entertainment world to the hill. Stick around to hear about more upcoming productions, performances, and products. Oh my.
Our Hill Highlights segment of the night focuses on all things happening around the hill. Through Northwest Arkansas, though Northwest Arkansas is a traditional hub for national entertainment, many local organizations have stepped up to create a vibrant entertainment scene. Musical, the band visit, the ba sorry, the band's visit is currently running. The 10-time Tony Award-winning show follows an Egyptian band's one-night stay in a desolate Israeli town. The, pr the production runs through November 5th. From one theater to another, the university's theater department's fall undergraduate play opens next week. A Midsummer's Night Dream will run the first two weekends of November. The play features two of our very own UATV anchors, Josh and Maddie. Those who are interested should stay tuned for ticket announcements. And of course, it wouldn't be October without this tradition. The cult classic Rocky Horror Picture Show will play at the Walton Arts Center on October 30th at the Baum Walker Hall. It will turn into an interactive event. Walton Arts says to bring your own props and dress up as your favorite character. Tickets cost $20. And that's a wrap on this episode of Razorback Reels. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Razorback underscore Reels. And be sure to tune in at 7.30 next Tuesday for our Halloween Spooktacular. I'm Drew Chamberlain. And I'm Ani Olivas. Have a great night.